All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, we're coming in to the end of our study of Leviticus 4, and so we're making a little bit of steady progress. We will have hopefully made it through the end of uh, four out of five of the major offerings that Leviticus describes by the time we're done tonight. Uh, and then we will progress a little bit further into Leviticus. But last week we dealt with the intro to this offering uh, that we said a lot of translations call the sin offering, but uh, that I think is better to describe as the purification offering because all of the offerings except the grain offering deal with sin. And we talked about uh, the fact that this is only about unintentional sin, that it doesn't help you at all if you are intending to do these things. And we looked at a passage in Numbers and talked about high-handed sins and the idea that if you uh, chose to disregard God's law, then you weren't going to have any opportunity for forgiveness, um, and especially not for purification in this process that Leviticus is telling us about. Uh, but we also noted that the sacrifice doesn't really help the sinner at all in the sense that it is washing you. That's not what its purpose was. The purpose of the purification offering is to purify the effects of your sin, not to cleanse your sin itself, because only the blood of Jesus that is to come many thousands of years later would be able to actually wash the sinner. So this is about washing the effects of your sin. So when you went around sinning, we described how in the Old Testament in particular, the land is polluted, the temple of God is polluted. Everywhere that you sin, you leave behind kind of a cloud that there's effects of your sin on the places that you are. And that's what the purpose of this offering was, was to remove or to cover those effects the different things that your sin had caused uh, as you went through the world. But the other animal sacrifices that we've studied, they've all gone through the order. If you look through Leviticus chapter 1 and Leviticus chapter 3, you see kind of a descending order, that you start with the most valuable animal, the bull, and then you go down in this list. And as it describes it, it always starts with the most valuable animal and then goes down to the least valuable sacrifice. Chapter 4 is going to continue this pattern, but it puts quite a twist on it, because this chapter isn't just about choosing to bring the most valuable sacrifice that you could afford. In chapter 1 and 3, it was up to the person who was bringing the offering to decide. They got a lot of freedom in it to say, okay, God, I can't afford to bring a bull, so I'm going to bring a goat, or I can't afford to bring that, so I'm going to bring birds, or I'm going to bring flour. And so there's a lot of ability there for you to choose to do what you were able to afford. But in this case, in chapter 4, there are specific categories of people that require very specific sacrifices. It's not up to them to decide. They don't get to decide, well, I fit in this category, but I can only afford this, so that's what I'm going to bring. That's not allowed under Leviticus. You have to bring exactly what God has said. And what we'll find as we go through this chapter is that sin seems to cost more for different types of people. Now, this brings up an interesting question that a lot of people have had as they've gone through life. There's a popular saying in our culture, and I can't find any origin from it. I looked around uh, for a little while and tried to find exactly where this comes from. If any of you know, I would be very interested in it. But lots of people say over and over again, sin is sin in the eyes of the Lord. I've heard that my whole life. People will go around and they'll spout this off and they'll say, well, it's all the same. It's all God's. In God's eyes, it's all sin. Oh, okay, there's something about that. But my first question tonight is, is sin equal in God's eyes? Anybody want to argue the other way? I mean, we got strong yeses. In the way that any sin, regardless of size, separates us from God, it, yes. But then he specifically lists like some things that are abominations or abhorrent to him, which sounds like pretty strong language, but other stuff doesn't quite make it to those lists. Well, I agree with everything you said, but I do have to ask the question up there. I, uh, yeah, in my experience. I had a neighbor one time to do everything. Yeah. Anything for him. He, he was a good person. I don't think I heard him say a swear a, a single word. He buy stuff and he can and, and I think go to church a couple times a year. He just didn't accept the Lord. Okay. And I say, well, will his will his punishment be the same as Khrushchev or Hitler? Yeah. Well, that's a really good question and one we'll deal with as we go through this. But I wanted your kind of input of what do you think? No, you're great. That's a, a great question. What do you think? What's your opinion on, do you think he's going to have the same punishment from your study of the Bible? Okay, different degrees of hell, yeah. Okay. It's just that over 
you're going to hell. It, to me, it just seems like it doesn't matter what you do. He said, even if you hate someone, you're, it's equal to killing someone. Okay. All so right. To me, I'm just like, it's just, to me, I'm just like, to God, is, there is no degree of sin. Sin is sin. There's, okay. It's sin. There's not really a black and white. It's just black. Okay. Yeah. You agree with Hannah? All right. Well, yeah, I think that's a good answer. And I think the way that if you look at this, some of the smartest people that were ever in the Christian history were the Puritans. And I love reading the Puritans. It's a hard thing and you better not do it when you're sleepy because it is very <laughs> dense material. But those people really thought through these things and they came up through and they studied the scripture really, really carefully. And one of the things they talked about is there is a difference vertically. There's no difference at all vertically in sin. That when we have the distance from God, we are vertically all the same because sin separates all of us equally, right? We're infinitely apart from God. But horizontally, when you compare one kind of sin from another, then suddenly you're talking about a different thing. And why we can see that is something like the Old Testament, right? The punishments for sin are quite different, right? God set up what the consequences for some of these sins are, and he didn't make them all the same. He didn't say, well, if you backtalk your parents, you're going to have the same punishment as if you commit adultery. It has a similar effect, and we don't really like that both of those lead to death, but most sins in the Old Testament would result in essentially a fine and sometimes a flogging. And we see that in the Old Testament where God even prescribes and says, if the elders of the Jewish people decide that somebody has to be beaten for their sin, they are only allowed to give them 39 lashes, right? That God prescribes the limit and says, you can decide how many times somebody gets hit with a whip, but it can't be more than 39. So there is a mercy element there, but God is willing to give them quite a lot of freedom to set up the thing and say, hey, you have disregarded God's law and this is the punishment. And so it's not necessarily the case that all sin is the same when we're talking about horizontal ideas, right? We understand that from a human justice perspective. If somebody goes to the gas station and they walk out with some candy, we don't want there to be the same punishment as if they'd murdered the cashier on the way, right? We understand that maybe there should be a difference because they've gone way beyond when they've committed a greater sin. But all of these offerings were about purification. Leviticus 4 is all going to be trying to accomplish the same thing. Yet, the cost is different. So just like the consequences for what a human has to pay in an earthly sense are different. The consequences of what you owe God for purification, that's different. And Leviticus 4 will show us that. We read the first few verses of this uh, last week, but we need to reread this section on uh, what the anointed, anointed priest has to pay so that we can compare it to the other options. If somebody could read verses 3 through 12 of chapter 4. If the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on the people, he must bring to the Lord a young bull without defect as a sin offering for the sin he has committed. He is to present the bull at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. He is to lay his hand on its head and slaughter it there before the Lord. Then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and carry it into the tent of meeting. He is to dip his finger into the blood and sprinkle some of it seven times before the Lord in front of the curtain of the sanctuary. The priest shall then put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrant incense that is before the Lord in the tent of meeting. The rest of the bull's blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. He shall remove all the fat from the bull of the sin offering, all the fat that is connected to the internal organ, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins and the long lobe of the liver, which he will remove with the kidneys. Just as the fat is removed from the ox sacrificed as a fellowship offering, then the priest shall burn them on the altar of burnt offering. But the hide of the bull and all its flesh, as well as the head and legs, the internal organs, and the intestines, that is all the rest of the bull he must take outside the camp to a place ceremonially clean where the ashes are thrown and burn it there in a wood fire on the ash heap. All right, thank you. So if you're studying this, and we will go through each one of these different types here, you look at it and you see the anointed priest by themselves, if they sin accidentally, if they unintentionally sin, they have to bring a bull. 
just for themselves. And if you read through this, you'll find that there's a decreasing amount of blood, a decreasing amount of value that each different type of person who is going through these lists has to bring. So if you're not really paying attention, you could assume, well, that must mean that the high priest is more valuable to God, right? The high priest is worth more, so his offering is clearly worth more. But that isn't the message of the scripture about our leaders, right? We're not supposed to have leaders like that. Jesus explicitly says, it will not be like that among you, as it is with the Gentiles. He says the Gentiles, they like to lord their power over those who follow them. That They like to say, hey, I'm the boss and you have to do what I say. You're going to have to obey me because I'm in charge of you. And Jesus says, no, it's not going to be like that. You're going to have to be a servant. So that's not a new principle that Jesus has put in place when he's talking about that. He's reminding them because they've done such a bad job of it. The Pharisees and the scribes have taken over this principle that you're supposed to be serving the people. That's what the Levites were always supposed to be doing. And they've instead inverted it and said, no, actually, we prefer being in charge. We prefer telling everyone what to do and being able to boss everyone else around. And so Jesus sets things back to right. But this high priest is God's specially chosen representative. For hundreds of years, there's an apparently unbroken line from father to son. It just goes down, father to son to son to son. And that's the list of how we get the anointed high priest. It's not that somebody had a contest, right? They didn't have Bible trivia. They didn't have some kind of competition of who's physically the most able to do these things, or they didn't have God stand them all up and have a light shine down and say, this is the most holy one. No, it was just, you are related to this person as the firstborn son, and so now you're the high priest. And it goes down through that for hundreds of years until Eli and his sons. And so several hundred years later, the high priests have messed up so badly that God says, nope, I'm going to step over this line and I'm going to go over to here. And so we see that God has personally selected this line. And he's chosen this person to be the only one who can represent the whole nation in front of him. There's only one person that God has chosen who can come before him. And they do this over and over every single year. And hopefully we'll be able to study the Day of Atonement together. But on that day, they're able to go in right before God's presence and represent the whole nation in the holiest place of God only because God has selected them. And so the priest's sin doesn't just affect them. We're told in Leviticus 4.3 that the sin of this person will thus bring guilt on the people. So we're being told that this person, the anointed priest, if they unintentionally sin, they bring guilt on everybody else. Can you imagine that? Just how frustrating that would be. We really hate the idea that somebody else's choices make anything happen to us, right? I mean, nobody likes that at all. If you're at work, if you're in a family, and you find out that somebody has made a mistake, and all of a sudden you have to fix it, it's a problem, right? All of us are going to get kind of up in arms about that because we're going to say, why should all of a sudden I have to interrupt everything I wanted to do to fix what you made as a mistake? And can you imagine that on a national level? We have some aspect of that, right? We all enjoy, no matter what your political opinions, when the president makes a mistake, everyone likes having this person who we can all point our fingers at and say, you did it. You're the part person that's to blame for whatever our problems are. But why did God hold the whole nation accountable for this one person's mistakes? I think this may be show just how much sin can affect anyone. Like, say, you take a little white lie. You're like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that, you know, all that. Well, it's going to affect the person you lied, and then you have might tell that lie again, and produce more lies, and soon not only have you put yourself into this big heap of trouble, you put a lot of people in a big heap of trouble as mm. well. Okay, yeah, so sin definitely impacts other people. But the whole nation, right? Maybe wouldn't it have been nice if it was just his family or maybe just his tribe? It was a nation because sin is bad. Because sin's bad. Yeah. Sin affects everyone. Well, this happens to all of us still, right? 
to a certain degree, that's what Paul's talking about when he says, sin entered the world through one man, right? Adam made a choice, and now we're all guilty, right? We don't like that idea. Nobody likes that idea. That's one of the big stumbling blocks. If you talk to anybody who's not a Christian, they'll say, I don't want to be judged based on what somebody else supposedly did. I want to be judged on my goodness or badness. I want my sins to be the reason that I'm judged. But another significant factor is their role as a leader. 2 Chronicles 19.11 shows us that this one man led all the other priests in any matter of the Lord. So this anointed priest is the leader above everyone else for all spiritual matters. It's kind of a pope-like position, right? This is one person who God has appointed and says, you are going to direct everything about spiritual leaders among my people. I mean, that's an incredible amount of responsibility, right? I love our pastor. I love our leadership in the assemblies of God. But I'm very thankful that they don't direct everything spiritual in our lives, right? We have some ability to say, well, I'm going to get close to God even if they are doing this other thing, even if they make the wrong choice. Because nowadays, lots of pastors are making the wrong choices. They are ignoring the word and saying, no, I'm going to do it this way, even though you think it should be this way. Well, the ability that we have to say, okay, well, we're going to get close to God anyway. They didn't have that. They have one person, one representative, who is supposed to bring the whole nation in front of God. So if this person sins, it's a real problem. Does somebody have a question or comment? Yeah, it's just reminding me a lot of like the history of like royalty, especially like with them fighting over the papacy because they're like, you're not in charge of us. Yeah. This is still Ukraine. You aren't in charge of us. And then they would even change the people of the country would change religions all because one person changed their religion. Sure. So if someone was Catholic, but then that royal person turned Protestant, the whole country would assume Protestant. Yeah, and throughout history, what we've learned is it's always a problem when there's one human who's between us and God, right? Because when there's one human, they're still human, right? Pastor Terry is great. He's still a human. He's going to make mistakes. He's going to have problems. And when he does, I'm thankful that our relationship with God isn't completely dependent on what he's doing, right? I'm thankful that for every pastor, because every pastor is fallible, whether they're Supposed to be or not, as the Pope sits on his chair of St. Peter and is supposed to be able to speak directly from God without saying anything wrong, he can still say something wrong, right? That They've said that many times. They've had to revise it and say, oh, he spoke from the chair, but it was still wrong. We're going to have to change it. As a matter of fact, in our case, Pastor Terry would be more responsible to God because he was called to lead us. To oh, yeah. Absolutely, that's a New Testament concept. And you, you are right on it, brother. We're definitely going to talk about that idea. Don't ever be sorry for knowing the Word. I am grateful for you and your ability to think through these things. You, you have definitely got it right on. But remember that these Levites and the priests in general were not just all doing the work of the sacrifice, right? They're not just leaders spiritually. They're also doing all of the spiritual things that we think of as ministry, they're pretty much responsible for worship, and they're also the teachers of the law. Deuteronomy 33.10 says, They teach Jacob your ordinances and Israel your law. Nehemiah 8.7-8 through 8 says, The Levites helped the people to understand the law, while the people remained in their places. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. That's a privilege, right? What I'm able to do here tonight is a privilege and a responsibility. The idea that God has asked you, make it so that my people can understand my word, boy, that's an awesome responsibility. It's a privilege, and yet that's the calling that these Levites had, is to say, here is what the word says, and this is what it means for you. They had to do that. Well, especially if you think, as we've talked before in this class, these people couldn't read. Almost no one was able to read except those that were trained. So if you think about that, the idea that you would be totally responsible for somebody else's understanding correctly of God's Word, boy, that's really hard, right? It's very difficult to get around. You better really study, because they're not going to get a backup, right? There's not devotions of the day coming all the time. There's not going to be study Bibles all the time. There's not going to be Christian television and Christian radio and podcasts and all of the resources that we have. You have the Levites, and they taught. 
And if they taught you wrong, you believed wrong, right? That's all you would know. Unless God gave you a supernatural revelation, you're only going to know what they've taught you. But it goes further, and we see several times in the prophets where they get in trouble. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Malachi 2.7 says, For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. So these people have a high calling, right? They're supposed to be the ones between God and the people in so many different ways. They're the ones that are supposed to be leading the people in the right way. So the effects of the sins of these anointed priests were very costly to purify. The same pattern of increased payment for purification continues. If somebody can read verses 13 through 21 of chapter 4, we'll see what happens with the congregation. 13 through, what? through 21. Unintentionally, and does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's command, commands, even though the community is unaware of the matter, when they realize their guilt and the sin they committed become known, the assembly must bring a young bull as a sin offering and present it before the tent of meeting. The elders of the community of the community are to lay their hands on the bull's head before the Lord, and the bull shall be slaughtered before the Lord. Then the anointed priest is to take some of the bull's blood into the tent of meeting. He shall dip his finger into the blood and sprinkle it before the Lord seven times in front of the curtain. He is to put some of the blood on the horns of the altar that is before the Lord in the tent of meeting. The rest of the blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He shall remove all the fat from it and burn it on the altar, and do with his bull just as he did with the bull for the sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for the community, and they will be forgiven. Then he shall take the bull outside the camp and burn it as he burned the first bull. This is the sin offering for the community. All right, so I assume you're reading from the NIV there, because we've got community twice. And if you study this passage here, you will find that in this section, the word community is used both times in this section, if you're reading from the NIV or the NLT. If you're reading from almost any other translation, you'll see two different words because there are two different words in Hebrew. You'll see community or congregation and assembly. So you're going to have these two different words where the NIV kind of just brushes over that and says, nope, there's no difference. These two things are synonyms and this is what it means. So we're going to keep going forward. Well, there's a good reason for that. And it's because no one really knows if there's a significant difference between these two words. There's been a lot of debate throughout history. Most Jewish people have historically believed this is the Sanhedrin, that the congregation is the high court of Israel. And so they think the congregation is kind of the law and spiritual group who decide disputed issues, and that the assembly means everybody who is over the age of 20 and is a male. So if you take that view, then you have one perspective. Christian groups have very often done what the NIV does and said means the same thing. What we're talking about is everybody all together, that all the people of Israel are having a problem at the same time. I think probably that it's something in between that that we have two different words because we're talking about two different things, probably the congregation that some scholars support is a smaller group of elders, that they aren't necessarily just the judges, but that they are a group of elders that represent the whole nation. And the whole idea here is that these people have committed some sin unintentionally again. All of this, as we go through, we have to remember, is all unintentional. None of this can be, we set out and decided we're going to worship idols. If they do that, this isn't going to help them at all. And so, we then have people who discover this sin, which are the different group, right? It says, when the assembly comes to find out that this congregation has committed this unintentional sin, this is what you have to do. So, it's kind of like a modern scandal, right? We don't really know what's going on with our leaders, but we know every few years, something's going to leak out. And we're going to find out what's been going on behind all the closed doors. And everybody's going to get upset for a few weeks, maybe a few months, if it's a particularly bad scandal. And then we're going to go back to them doing the same kinds of things as they've been doing before. But when that happened in ancient Israel, there was a process you had to follow, right? 
You didn't just have the media cycle where everybody screams at each other for a few weeks and then you go back to it. You have to go and do one of these sin offerings if this is unintentional. But this offering, no matter what, is dealing with national sin. Is national sin still possible? What's an example? There's a lot with our government accepting standard in the LBGTQ. Okay. And all that. That is a national sin of our government. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, just any examples. I will say that if you've studied history, that our president and Army General U.S. Grant, he actually said that he thought that slavery was a national sin and that the Civil War was God's judgment on the United States that he believed that that whole process where 600,000 Americans die, that that is God's judgment for us having this national sin. I don't know what you think about that, but this is an idea that people have had in the past. But what about unintentional national sin? I mean, most of the things we think of, abortion, same-sex marriage, all these things, it's hard to argue that you didn't mean to do it, right? <laughs> so unintentional national sin, is that still possible? I mean, I guess, yeah. I guess that if the leaders knew it, we wouldn't. We wouldn't know if they did. I'm sure. Sure. They did, but we wouldn't know. Yeah. I guess, They're not going. I guess. They're that for this I guess they, I kind of wonder about like choosing not to accept, like for instance, when quotas are reached in World War II, like you stop accepting people who are refugees from dire situations. You don't intend for all those people to end up dead, but was your choice? I mean, okay, it's sure. Instead of omission, I guess, like you omitted. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. Sending all that money to Iran this time. Okay. Thinking it was going to be humanitarian, but. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, so I don't want to get too far off into politics there because we can definitely uh, deal with that. You're, you're right. You're right. I'm not saying you did anything wrong. Sure. Absolutely. Mm. And they're not following up, making sure that Germany keeps their end of the bargain, which makes Germany invade Pol all of Poland and all that in World War II. Okay, so kind of a sin of omission, like we talked about last week, that you know the good you ought to do and you don't do it. And if you have something like that, then maybe. Okay. It's um, when it, during the, the treaty that ended World War One, they thought, oh, we're going to show them. Like, all they did was like, okay, take all of Germany's power away. They didn't think, really, that the World War II was going to happen again until later on. They're like, yeah, we did that on ourselves when World War II finally... Okay. Yeah. So once you discover that you've had a national sin, unintentional or not, how does a nation deal with it today? We don't offer a purification offering, right? We're not going to bring a bull into a tent that doesn't exist. So what would we do? Okay, reparations. All right, so we try to make it right in some way or another. Okay, I can see that idea. Okay, yeah, some consequences. I can see what you're going with there. We, we, we try to make them better. We try to make them better. Try to make it better, yeah. Yeah, I think that's an important idea of trying to purify yourself, is that you're trying, as uh, we were talking with Lee earlier, you can't just... Keep doing it and expect that God's going to clean you up, right? We said last week that it's not an automatic car wash. When we ask God to purify us, he's expecting us to do something about it, right? He gives us the power, but he's not just going to clean us without any input or work from us. And so I think that's true nationally too, right? We seem to all kind of agree that there's the possibility of national sin. If we were to repent nationally of some of these sins, it's probably not going to be an immediate purification, right? The effects of those sins are going to continue for a little bit. And as we see in Leviticus, sometimes the price is high, right? For the first two categories, for the high priest and the national sin, they have the highest price. They have almost identical descriptions. If you look through this section from verse 3 all the way down through verse 21, it's almost word for word. In fact, in verse 20, it says, He shall do with the bull just as is done with the bull of sin offering, meaning the one for the anointed priest. So 
God is saying, I'm going to repeat almost exactly the same thing because you have to do almost the same process. Well, that makes sense because we're both dealing with national sins, right? We said that the anointed priest brings guilt onto the whole nation. Well, if some other group, whether it's the whole nation or the elders of the nation, bring guilt on the nation, it makes sense that national guilt requires the same payment. But now we move to a lesser payment. If somebody could read verses 22 through 26. All right. So we're told there in verse 22 that all of this is about when a ruler or a leader, and we're not talking about priests, we're not talking about Levites, we're talking about political leaders, we're talking about people in the secular community, tribal heads for the most part when the time of Leviticus was being written. You've got a leader over each one of those 12 tribes, right? And you've got somebody who is representing you just like we do today in political issues trying to figure out where we should build the roads, trying to figure out where the zoning ordinances should be, where you put the trash, all that kind of stuff that political leaders have to deal with. I'm sure they had some of the same concerns three or 4,000 years ago. And yet, like today, we've just said, political leaders make mistakes, right? They make mistakes a lot. And we actually kind of like having political leaders because if we have them, we get to complain about them. And we get to say, man, I think somebody should do a better job. And I notice very few of us want to stand up and be that somebody, but we do realize that they are making a lot of mistakes. And again, maybe it's not all unintentional, but they are making quite a few mistakes. But what we see here is that these people have a different purification offering than the first two. They have a male goat without blemish. The first two had a bull without blemish. And so quite a big step down in value. A significant amount less meat, a significant amount less uh, blood, way different process going on here. This less expensive offering seems to indicate that there's less pollution from their sins than what these other offerings were. Why would there be less pollution from a political leader than a spiritual leader? Why would a political leader cause less pollution than a spiritual leader? Well, if we're thinking separation between state of church and state of power, the political leader would probably not have to do a whole lot of the spiritual stuff. While the spiritual leader has to work on the soul and the spirit of the people, the political person just makes sure that everything goes well in the country. They're not really worried about souls. Yeah, okay, so I think, go ahead. Yeah, even, I mean, it's just a small, he has a smaller group of people, and he's not held as accountable by God as, sure. as, as the, uh, the uh, priest. Yeah, I, I think it's a lot that even when you get to kings, they are not as directly responsible for the relationship between the people and God, right? That, yes, the king matters, and we very frequently in a book like Kings see that the wickedness of the kings is a major problem, but... It is the prophets and the priests that usually get some of the worst call-outs. Because what God is saying is, you should have known better, right? Because you were the ones who were trained in it. You're the ones who are called to it. You're the ones who are the selected representatives to represent me. So the priest is supposed to be a representative between God and humans. The king, more between humans, right? right. The king in Europe, they will later come to say, oh, I am the direct representative between God and humanity, Henry VIII. He proclaims that he is the Pope over the English church and so decides that he's going to be both an earthly leader and this spiritual leader. But that doesn't work out all that well for them either as we see that you still have a human in charge, right? And any time that there's a human in charge, they're going to make serious mistakes. <laughs> Absolutely. Many wives is going to lead to that. But I would say uh, he probably had some issues besides that as well. Uh, but finally, we'll read the purification offering of the commoners. If somebody could read verses 27 through 31. 
any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any one of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done and realizes his guilt for the sin which he has committed is made known to him, he shall bring for his offering a goat, a female without blemish, for his sin which he has committed. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill the sin offering <clears throat> in the place of the burnt offering. The priest shall take some of his blood with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. And all of its fat he shall remove <clears throat> as the fat is removed from the peace offering. And the priest shall burn it on the altar for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be forgiven. All right, thank you. So, the common people have many more options than the other group. The top-end offering is now up to you. So, it's much more like the first two offerings of animal sacrifices, the burnt-end peace offering or well-being offerings, that in those, you brought what you could afford. So, this person is able to choose, I am supposed to bring, if I can afford it, either a female goat or a female lamb. That's the top-end offering that they are able to bring. But the common people have even more options than that that we don't see in Leviticus chapter 4. To see those, you have to scroll down a little bit in your Bible app or turn a page if you're still using a conventional Bible as some enjoy. You'll see in verses five, uh, 7 through 11 of chapter 5 that they have other offerings available where they, if they can't afford a female goat or lamb, they are able to bring two birds or choice or fine flour, just like in the burnt offering, where they have these options because there is a continual decline in perceived value, but these people are given a provision because they may not have it, right? It's hard for a high priest to argue that they don't have it when the community is going to give the bull, right? They can't make that excuse. It's hard, especially for a tribal leader, because they've got the wealth of all the other people of the tribe that they can call on. If they don't have it personally, certainly they would be able to say, hey, tax time, we're getting ourselves a male goat because I've got to make a sin offering. I've got to purify ourselves here as a tribe. And so we have to come together as a community. But we see this continual decline in perceived value where bulls are for national sins and male goats for political leaders. And then female goats or lambs or birds or flower and it wasn't only the type of sacrifice, but the procedure. If you're paying attention as we were reading along there, there are kind of subtle differences. Now, we said the first two sacrifices, it's almost identical. There's almost exactly the same language as you go through Leviticus chapter 4. But what you find as you go down through the rest is that the procedure changes when you're a part of the other groups. Now, you've probably all seen a diagram of the tent of meeting in the past, but we'll look at it again together, because in this tent here, you see at the very outside here, this little man in his kind of brown tunic out there, standing on the outside of the outermost curtain there, that is as far as anyone who wasn't a priest could come. They come to the entrance of the tent of meeting, that outermost blue curtain there, and that's where they bring their offering. So that's as far as they are able to go. And the blood for the political leaders and the commoners is put on the horns of this altar. This first altar that you see just inside there is the altar for burnt offerings. And if you look at that, it is much larger than almost any other fixture that's inside the tent of meeting. Now, they don't go inside there because they have to only come to the entrance. The priests are the ones who are inside, and they're taking their offering from them. And then they are walking up to this altar for the burnt offering, and you'll see on it, some horns on the corners there. And as you look at that, you'll see that those are pointed upwards. And it's never told to us in the Bible why God wanted horns on these altars. But the assumption is that it's calling your mind up towards heaven and reminding you that everything that's being done on these altars is directly for God. And so when a person who was a political leader or a commoner sins and they bring their blood, that blood goes on those horns. The priest takes some of it and he rubs it on the horns of that altar for the burnt offering. Could it also be possible, like, it's a very, very subtle uh, reference to Jesus having the crown of thorns? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a neat idea. I think that's a really cool idea that it might be the uh, crown of thorns that is being called out. And 
So we see that going on in both the burnt offerings altar and also the incense altar when national sins were committed. We'll see in our uh, picture here on the right that this is a mock-up of what the incense offering would be put on on the altar further in. If you remember that diagram, inside the inner, inner tent is this altar that is on the right here that was continuously burning very specialized incense. And if national sins were committed, if the anointed priest or the national sin from the congregation was committed, the blood of the bull goes on the horns of that altar. So a different place for the blood to be put there, but also the blood for the national offering is sprinkled, right? It tells us that it's sprinkled seven times. And here on the left, we see the inside mock-up of the Holy of Holies and the holy place in front of that. And in this holy place in front of it, right in the middle there is the small incense offering that you have on the right. And so the high priest has to take the blood of that bull and seven times sprinkle it on the inner curtain. That's right. That's exactly right. So why would God want the blood closer to him for national sins? Why did God want blood to come in closer? He has blood outside on that burnt offering altar for everybody's common sense. So just by the math, you should have many, many times that people are putting blood on that burnt offering because there are many, many more commoners. But the high priest or the national sin would be hopefully pretty rare. And if you have that rare time, there's blood that's coming in all the way up to the curtain that they cannot cross but that one time a year. They're not allowed to go through that curtain except on the Day of Atonement. But yet God has commanded blood to be put on that barrier right between him and his nation. So why does God want the blood to be closer to him for these national sins? Any ideas? Well, I think we've already established that the national sin carries more weight. Okay. So therefore, maybe the, the purification for that needs to be closer to God to make its way further in. Okay, yeah. I think a significant part of it is that the individual who's going in, the high priest, is bringing his own sins in, right? All the time, he's bringing his own sins, and also... If we assume that it is correct that in verse 13 we're dealing with national sins, he's a part of the nation, right? Whether it's his sin or it's the sin of everybody around him, it's still his problem, right? Because he's bringing the representation of God to the people when he goes out, and he's bringing the representation of the people into God when he goes in. So when he goes in, he's bringing all of the unintentional sin that has accumulated since the last time he's made this offering. So it makes sense to me that God wants this blood as close as possible because he is trying to get them as close as possible, right? God's presence requires a covering over sin. That's a very established principle that we've looked at in Leviticus. But the anointing protected the high priest, but it didn't allow uncovered sin to go in, right? We know that... In this Day of Atonement that we'll talk about, this man is going to have to go into that curtain. And once he goes in there, the scripture tells us God's presence was as close as anywhere else it ever got before the time of Jesus, right inside that curtain. And that if he had gone in there, he would have died. If he hadn't had his sin covered with blood, he would have died. If he just decided, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway, immediate death. Well, it is if you... I don't think you should use an unspecified uh, method of execution with God because God probably doesn't take it lightly. If you decide you're going to do it a different way, you get in trouble for that. And we'll, we'll probably see some of that in Leviticus chapter 10. But the incense altar there on the right, it represents the prayers of the people. This incense that's going up all the time is representing the prayers. And our prayer life is affected by sin. It's only when it's covered by the blood that it can be effective, right? If we decide that we are going to approach God with our requests, with our petitions, and say, God, I need something from you, 
The scripture in the Old Testament actually says the prayers of the wicked are an abomination to God. That's a tough thing, right? We really don't like that word. We use abomination for the sins that we think are at the very bottom. And God says, your prayers are an abomination if you come in here doing whatever you think is right. And that's why when we see in James that it says the prayers of the righteous are effective, that it matters whether or not we're doing what God has said. We don't really like that idea. We prefer it that God is merciful and God is compassionate. And whenever I need something, if I'm in trouble, I just say, God, I need your help. Fix it for me. And maybe he will out of his mercy because his mercies are new every morning. And yet, James tells us, you want an effective prayer life? You want to see something move when you ask God for it to move? Do what he says. Pay attention to what he's told you to do. We've said that there's a critical difference that I think helps us really understand one of the major shortcomings of the Levitical priesthood. Every offering, if you've looked through what we've been reading together, every offering says at the end of the offering, then your sins will be forgiven. If you look through there, it says it in verse 20, in verse 26, and in verse 31, it says, then your sins will be forgiven. Well, that's a great thing, right? We all want to hear, then your sins will be forgiven. But there's a problem. In Leviticus 8.34, we see that there's atonement for the high priest, but there's never one time in Scripture, not in Leviticus, not in the whole Bible, does it ever say that the high priest's sins will be forgiven. That's really rough, right? If you look at the offering for purity in Leviticus chapter 4, verses 3 through 12, it ends... With him having sacrificed the bull, him having done everything God says, and no forgiveness is pronounced. It simply says, this is what you do. You go in there, you act as if you're going to be forgiven, you pour out the blood, you sprinkle it onto the uh, curtain, you put it onto the altar of incense, but no forgiveness is pronounced. So this brings up our question of the week from last week. Why didn't God forgive the sins of the anointed priest? Okay. I think there's an element there, yeah. Anyone else? I mean, it's pretty rough, right? You're going to make mistakes. Every single person. We've said that over and over tonight. If you're a pope, if you're a king, if you're a pastor, no matter who it is, you may never decide, I'm going to go commit adultery. But you're still going to commit sins. You're still going to let your mouth get ahead of you. You're still going to have lots of trouble with anger or jealousy, all kinds of problems that God has set or sins. And yet, no forgiveness of sins for this person. Why? He knew better, okay. I think that that's part of it, maybe. But I think one of the main problems that we see in Leviticus over and over again is many times God doesn't do something because he can't. We often think of God as being able to do anything he wants, but those things can't violate his character, right? We know that God's goodness and his holiness control his power and his ability, right? God would never do something that is evil. It would never even enter his mind, the scripture says. God cannot Forgive sins without a mediator. That's a tough idea. That's right. You can't forgive a mediator if he's a mediator. But why does God demand a priest be involved in the forgiveness of sins? Because direct interaction with a sinner would destroy them. If God was right there next to this man who is right in his holy presence, the holiest spot that God has on earth, he would die. If he goes in there and God interacts with him directly, he would die. And yet this is going to apply even for forgiveness because there is no one between God and the high priest. No one at all. Now, direct interaction would have caused such a trouble. But the high priest is representing God very directly. This one man acted as the single direct connection between the holiest presence of God and humanity. 
Because leaders matter, God demands more, right? That's what David's getting at. We see that as a New Testament principle where it tells us in James, be careful that not many of you become teachers because you will be held to a higher standard. That's a tough idea, right? The idea that because I choose to teach, God is going to judge differently. We don't like that. We want to say that's an Old Testament concept. I don't like the idea that God's going to think about what I'm doing or saying differently than if I hadn't decided to accept His call to teach. That's not fun. That's not something anybody really wants. But that's what God says. And He says it over and over again. He even makes it clear that the concept that these people are doing something different happens in Hebrews 13, 17, where God says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls and will give an account. Well, that's a tough thing to say, right? Nobody wants to do that. I don't think anybody wants to give an account for somebody else's soul. Just like the whole national sin concept. We want to say, God, this isn't a problem for me. That's their problem. They sinned. You deal with them. But God says, if you are one of my leaders, I'm going to hold you responsible for what they do. That's terrible. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we're all, we are all called to be ambassadors. That's right. And no pastor is the anointed priest, right? We absolutely know that our pastors are different because we only have one mediator. One of the most, most amazing verses in the Bible is 2 Corinthians 5.21, which says, For our sake he made, that's God, God made him, Jesus, to be sin." who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's an incredible verse. What we've just said is that God cannot forgive the sins of the anointed priest because there is no mediator. Because God does not want to get that close to the sin or he would obliterate them. And yet, he sent the fullness of God to become sin. We don't really like that verse either. We want to say Jesus was around sin. Jesus was getting acquainted with sinners. But it says he became sin. He didn't know sin at all and became it so that we might become the righteousness of God. Wow, that's a powerful verse. And then 1 Timothy 2, 5-6 through 6 says, There is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. So, we have one mediator, right? That's very different because it's not an anointed priest who dies and hands it down to his son, right? That's kind of the Catholic model, that Jesus handed it down to Peter, and then it goes down through the generations, from one pope to the next pope to the next pope, that you're going to have an anointing that passes from one human to the next. But Hebrews tells us, or rather... 1 Timothy tells us that it is not humans anymore. That we no longer have an anointed priest between us and God who is a human, who's fallible, who's committing these kinds of sins, unintentional or not. We have Jesus Christ as our mediator. He's the one who purifies us. Hebrews 4, 14-16 tells us we have one great high priest and he is eternally sinless. So sin isn't sin. It's not equal. Our idea at the beginning, is sin all the same in the eyes of God? No. We see that in Leviticus and throughout the entire scripture, that in terms of consequences and what it costs to make it right, it's not the same. All sin separates us from God, but the price the guilty pay isn't the same. Now, we don't know exactly what that means. We had someone named Dante Alighieri, and he wrote the Divine Comedy and has all of this idea about different levels of hell, right? He imagined this concept that if you're an adulterer, you're going to go to this kind of hell, and if you're a liar, you're going to go to that kind of hell. And he tried to sort this stuff out and say, this is the punishment for this and that. And for a little while there, that bled into the church for a few hundred years where people thought, oh, well, there's all kinds of levels of hell, and there's different punishments, and we know what some of them are. Well, we don't. We don't know what any of that means. What we know is that everyone who dies in their sins dies eternally, 
and that they will suffer eternally. We don't know anything else. We know very little about the specifics of what that looks like. But what we do know is that we choose whether we pay or we accept the payment that's already made. Just like you go to the grocery store or the drive through if someone says, hey, the person ahead of you paid for you, you can be very stubborn and say, no, I don't care. I'm paying it myself. I don't care what they paid for me. I don't care what they're doing for me. I don't want their mercy. I don't want their grace. I'm paying. And that's what a lot of people say. They hear about this message and they hear, your sins are paid for. You can offer nothing to God for your sins that's adequate. Absolutely nothing you could do would be able to pay. Because Jesus has already paid, right? But we can choose, do we accept the payment or not? We don't bring the blood of animals to God to purify ourselves anymore, right? If you want to get pure for something you unintentionally did, which most of us don't even think about the sins we unintentionally do, but if you did, you're not going to go out and find yourself a lamb and slaughter it, right? We're just not going to try to do that. But we must appreciate that the price has been paid, right? We have to realize that that matters. The reason that flour, just a little bit of grain, did anything at all is because of Jesus, right? If there wasn't the sacrifice of Jesus to come, what good would flour have been? I've not heard a satisfactory answer from a Jewish person about that. How can you tell me that flour can do anything when it says there is no forgiveness of sins without the payment of blood? Blood of flour? Doesn't work. But God accepts flour as a down payment, as earnest money, and says, you can put the flour down, because when my son comes, he's going to make up the rest. That's a really amazing concept. God takes sin very seriously. He takes sin, unintentional sin, so seriously that we can't even understand it. Most of us don't ever think about unintentional sin. I don't know about you, but until I was doing this study, I hadn't thought about committing an unintentional sin in years. <laughs> Just hadn't even considered it, right? So yeah. Well, sure, because now I feel that there's a call to repentance. Sincerely, I feel that the Scripture tells me God cares about the sin you didn't mean to do. And that means you better care as well, right? He cares more about your accidental sin than most of us care about our on-purpose sin, right? He cares about it a lot. God takes our willful sin so seriously, most of us don't even want to think about that. If we look at how seriously He takes unintentional sin, well, I bet that changes what you think about what His opinion of intentional sin is. Men unintentional sin be like, you're not aware of it. You don't, you don't even know it's a sin. You don't even know where it happened. Yeah. But I think we've pointed out last week that the Spirit of God living inside of you is going to bring that to your mind at some point, right? And especially if you're sensitive. Especially if you say, as David did in Psalm 51, God, search me, right? If you ask God to search me and show me, He will. That's a tough prayer, but He will. Hebrews 10, 26-29 says, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has insulted the Spirit of grace. Wow. That's preaching you don't hear very much anymore, huh? You don't hear the idea that if you keep sinning, if you look God's law in the face and say, I don't feel like it today. I'm going to do it my way. He says, if you did that under the law of Moses, just like we talked about in Numbers, Two or three witnesses, that's all it took. Two people see you do that, and they're not allowed to give you mercy. God commanded it and said, you who found him have to take him immediately to the elders and throw rocks at them until they die. Wow, 
There's no appeals process. There's no delay of 10, 15 years before the capital punishment is put on. That same day, probably that same hour. <laughs> I think it would. But that's the law of Moses. And then under the law of grace that so many of us think is cheap and free, we're told in Hebrews, if you continue to do that and trample the Son of God underfoot, how much worse is it going to be for you? Isn't it terrifying? That's what we're told. A certain terrifying expectation of judgment. Whew. You better be careful. The point of this verse isn't to scare us. It's not to make us think, God's going to get me if I keep going in this way. It's to shake you. It's to make you realize that God cares about what you do. He cares about what you do on purpose and what you do on accident. God doesn't demand purity because he wants us to live a joyless life. He demands purity because sin is poison. And we can't live near him if we continue in it. The more we sin, the further we get from God. The more we purify ourselves, the closer God will come to us. That's a tough thing. Our question of the week for next week, do Christians still owe God anything after their sin is forgiven? All right. Do Christians still owe God anything after their sin is forgiven? Is there a price to be paid? All right. oh, next week, next week, come back next week, man. Bring it. I want to hear it. Other questions, comments about this week? Leviticus chapter 4. All right, what are you confused about? By you of your sin, and what did I say that has confused that this well, that time? We're saying that in the verse it says um, that we are now forgiven for our sins after we, and we shall be forgiven. That's absolutely right. My point of why the purification is about the objects and not the person is because the blood goes on the tent. So by the blood going on the tent, what's being demonstrated is that the blood isn't covering you. So what I'm saying is you are forgiven. You are pronounced forgiven, but it's earnest money, just like the flower. So your forgiveness isn't by the blood of the animal. It's accepted as the blood of the animal. But we've seen in previous weeks in Hebrews that it tells us that the blood of calves and goats could not forgive sin. So even if you poured out all the blood of the animals that existed on earth, no one's sin could be forgiven because it's not sufficient. So it's accepted as a down payment. God accepts it as covering, but he's really covering the places of worship. And we see that because of where the blood goes. Because the blood goes on God's things and not on God's people. So it's the blood of Jesus that is going to go on God's people. We are only washed in the blood when Jesus' sacrifice is made. The blood of the animals is never applied to the sinner because they aren't being cleansed by it. They're being pronounced forgiven, but they are not forgiven by the blood. So that leads me to this um, last part when you were talking about the mediator. You were saying the high priest cannot be forgiven because nobody else is a mediator for him. But here Christ came and they're labeling him as the one and all mediator. That's right. Is that just because he was the fullness of God? Well, no, so the, uh, in First Timothy there, it's talking about when Jesus has ascended to the Father. So it gets very complicated because of the eternity of the Godhead. But there's this idea that there's a trinity that exists when Jesus is on earth and a trinity that exists when he's not on earth. And the reason for that is this whole concept of him emptying some aspect of godness, right? That if he was everywhere at once, he couldn't be a human body, right? You understand that idea that if he was omnipresent, he can't be a single person in Galilee because he would be all over the universe and split up into some kind of strange quantum force. That's not what Jesus was like, so something else had to happen. So what I'm saying with that is that what Jesus does in his ministry after his ascension is different than what he does in his ministry before his incarnation. So before Jesus comes, he has a very different ministry. And a lot of that isn't because God is saying, oh, I'm going to 
only let you do this if you do that. It's because the price has to be paid. So there is some talk of that in a book like Hebrews where it says God gave him a name above all names because of his obedience. So that is a scriptural concept. But I like to more emphasize the fact that God cannot do some of these things until the price is paid. So sin is an infinite distance between us and God. And because it's an infinite distance, only the infinite can pay it. So a finite bull, a finite goat, that can never pay that infinite distance. Because if you know anything mathematically about infinity, you understand that you can't plug enough numbers into infinity to ever get to the end of it, right? So it's just basically it's, us taking one step into a path you're probably not going to even finish if you do that kind of knowledge. But exactly. You would be dumping animals into an endless hole. It would be a bottomless pit. So the only way to bridge that gap is to put infinity between us and God. And that's the Son, Jesus Christ. So the infinite God is sacrificed for our sins. And it requires that infinite sacrifice to be able to bridge that gap. So until that gap is bridged, there is no mediator. Because it's a different concept than the earnest money idea, right? That he is doing something now that he could not do until the price was paid. So that's why we had human mediators like the high priests. We had those people because the sin hadn't been paid for. So there's still this big chasm between us and God. So Aaron and his descendants, they try. They're, most of them are doing their very best to keep God's law perfectly, but they fail. And that failure, even the presence of Adam's sin in their life, means that they can't be a perfect mediator. And so they have no one to mediate between God and them, because Christ can't do that until he has paid that price. I hope that that wasn't too confusing uh, and get you somewhere if you have any further comments or questions all right it's a very confusing idea that if you want to uh, pursue that it's the concept of the eminent 